Fight Night Picks fans, the UFC haven't been back to Canada since 2019, the land of the Maple Leaf. And you guys know that, listen, I mean, coming up here in Canada, we do things just a little bit differently. Some big time fights, some big time things to go over here with Fight Night Picks. The Canadian return, Matt, as we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. It's so sweet! It is! Ah. And just like that, we're back with Fight Night Picks getting set for UFC 289 coming up this weekend. As always, one half of your host, you do a Craig Allen Twitter and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP. I started a Twitter firestorm on Saturday night, and I'm still responding to the people. But Matt, we you can find you. You're over there on Twitter, at Matt Allen FNP. And when we're looking forward to this card, I mean, it is the fifth overall card from Vancouver, British Columbia. And overall, if you look down through it, UFC 115, probably the best card from BC. I mean, you had Rich Franklin knocking out Chuck Liddell. You wow. also had, I mean, a big-time fight where Mirko Krokop submitted Pat Barry. So, some wild stuff out of BC, but the first time that the UFC has been back since 2019 and that was Justin Gaethje against one Cowboy Cerrone so we get to look forward to this card 10 ranked fighters on the card there's a total of six Canadians because I count Diana Belbizia she's adopted she Canada is. as the country so Canada and Romania for her and you can see them in the thumbnail that's over there on that side but overall I mean a title fight for the Bantamweight strap up at the top Amanda Nunes the quote I mean, this is a 12th straight title fight for her. I gotta crazy? be honest, I was way more down on this card than I should have been before I started doing the research, because I think we have a lot of very fun and competitive fights going all the way up and down this card. Look at, like, Blake Builder versus Kyle Nelson. That's not a fight that's gonna really wow you name value-wise, but is that fight gonna deliver action-wise? It's almost guaranteed to, and that's buried on the prelims. I just think this is one of those cards where it might not have the crazy star name value that some other pay-per-views do, but I think it's definitely going to, to deliver in terms of action. And 11 total fights as of the taping this on Sunday night sure. out right now. Chris Chris Dawkins, who's supposed to take on Khalil Roundtree, but it looks like they're going to find an opponent for Roundtree, so we will update you as soon as that fight is updated for the former Warhorse. Now he's going without a nickname. Ultimately, again, only one UFC debut on the card. It's Astro Boy. Did he pick up those big red boots? I don't know if he did, but it's Steven Erseg representing Australia. He's taking on David Dorjak, so a lot of fun fights to look forward to. You you know to get that down and dirty with question mark kicks that's two hours before the prelims on saturday if i switch a pick i usually get it wrong so we'll see what happens on that show a big time weekend of fights you're gonna want to keep it locked in with fight name picks we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. fierce nicknames are afoot at strawway we have the Warrior Princess Diana Belbizia representing Ontario, Canada now, formerly of Romania, where she definitely got a big time head start in the martial arts. And Belbizia taking on Spider Girl Maria Oliveira. And when you look at this matchup, I mean, for Belbizia, her last time out was quite a while ago. She lost to the now 6-6 six and six Gloria De Paula. And Maria Oliveira's first UFC win was Gloria De Paula. So if I put my tinfoil hat on... Maria Oliveira wins by MMA math. But what I can tell you about both of these fighters is that they have interesting lineages to get into the martial arts. For Maria, Maria Oliveira, you see that really high tie stance. You see her really struggle with takedowns if she's pressured up against the fence. She herself kind of gets a little wonky with the striking defense, gets hit a fair bit. We saw that against Marina Rodriguez on Dana White's yeah, contender series. Do you mind series. if I do just cut in quick? Both these fighters have extensive records, but I wouldn't say they fight at the level of experience that they do. If that's no, fair to I say. mean, for Maria Oliveira, fights at a PRVT down in Brazil. You know that gym for Jessica Andrade at the top, but then Carol Hosa and D. Gomes as well. Maria Oliveira, another cog or another piece in that puzzle. But if you look at her for Oliveira, I mean, she does struggle part and parcel with the grapplers. She struggles with those pressure fighters. But once she's able to land her own shots, you saw that at the end of the third round of Oliveira's last fight Definitely. against Vanessa Demopoulos. She doesn't cut the cage at all. She just chases Demopolis and throws like this all the way across. And my biggest point about this fight is for Oliveira, it's the Muay Thai for Diana Belbizia. I mean, she has karate in her back pocket. She was a 2018 IKF World Champion Karate and a 2012 WAKO uh, Kickboxing Champion. 
For Belbizia, we saw her drop Hannah Goldie in that fight. That was a really good win. But for Belbizia, it's either we're all the way in or we're all the way out. And the parts and parcels of her own game, it's really tough to get a sustained offense out of Belbizia to the point where both of these fighters fight the exact same way. It's a lot of arm punches and naked kicks. And that's why it really comes down to whoever's moving forward is probably going to end up winning a lot of these rounds because I don't think either fighter's going to be landing these big crippling shots from the outside. And I agree 100% with what you said about Oliveira. She's a striker who has a very fine Goldilocks zone, if you will. If you're really close, she doesn't really have a lot of attacks to deal with it. And you can threaten a lot with the takedown too, which is also going to limit her striking game. But... Although she does chase a lot, if she is able to keep you on the end of her punches, she does throw pretty good volume. She is able to throw while moving forward. But again, if Belbeach is able to evade some of those early strikes and then start landing her own kicks, I could see her win some of these rounds. But again, like you said, the way Belbeach fights this fight is probably going to determine how she wins it. Because if she is that fighter who can fight all the way in, I think she has a great opportunity to go out there and win this matchup. But if she's too hesitant on the back foot, I'm not saying she's going to get beat up a lot on the back foot, but you understand what I mean. If she's just going to get out volume and I think in a fight where neither fighter might be landing big knockout strikes it might just come down to whoever has the higher volume and whoever's moving forward and if you do look at a for Belbizia there's going to be a lot of connections that are on this card she's had Kyle Nelson in her corner in the past they both train out of House of Champions and her crew Alan Hamalgian and you know fighters like Gabriel Varga I mean he was a Bellator kickboxing champ he since switched over into MMA late in his career Shane Campbell who ended up fighting in the UFC as well as oh boy the general Gentleman, Josh Hill, all out of that gym. So a lot of good fighters out of there. But for Belbizia, it's been two mixed results. Obviously, she loses that UFC debut. She comes in, takes on Molly McCann, gets completely out wrestled. Then she fights Liana Jojua, goes for her own takedowns, and then gets armbarred. Predictably, she beats Anna Goldie in her last time out, loses a close decision to Gloria De Paula for Maria Oliveira in the UFC. It's one and two. A loss to Tabitha Ricci. She was a big underdog in that one. Get taken down and controlled for large portions. Beat Gloria De Paula by split decision is about what a plus 250 or thereabouts and then her last time out lost to Vanessa Demopoulos where she could take down exactly. and struggled in the ground positions but when Oliveira could run forward and throw those punches across the cage she had success and her nickname comes from the fact that she really liked Anderson Silva as a kid and we get to see glimpses of that well, we in her fights. To that. But it really is tricky. So for me, again, yeah, it definitely does come down to, it comes down to the range and the volume because, again, it's a lot of not putting the body, not putting the core, not putting the legs into the punches. We're throwing our arms out there, rock em, sock em style. And a lot of, when I say naked leg kicks, arms are still up, core stays tight. We're popping that leg out there and it's a leg kick. Now, I would think that, in my mind after watching some of the tape on both of these ladies. I mean, Belbizia, you talk about the level of competition. Oliveira went over and fought in Ryzen in a fight against Asakura where she's probably going to lose, and she did. She got taken down, she lost that one in the ring. Whereas Belbizia, at one point, even though it was on the prelims, it was one of those KSW Coliseum cards against Ariane Lipsky. She got submitted. We've seen Belbizia before the UFC struggle with the takedowns, struggle with the submissions, and that really is the the weaker part that we've seen out of the Belbizia game. So when it does come down to this one, odds are close on the matchup. We have a look at the topology votes. Because they're so similar as fighters. That's it. It's a surprise to us it is to you when we look at the topology votes like this. I'm going to say over under 60% the spider girl Oliveira. I was going to dragon's dead it. I was giving like 51% Oliveira. I think it's going to be under. I think it'll be closer to 50-50. And it's completely different. 791 total votes. 72% Oliveira. 91% by decision for the 28% that have Belbizia, 84% by decision. So the fans see this one going to a decision. How do you see this one going? I agree with the fans. I doubt we're going to get a stoppage inside the distance in this fight. Maybe uh, one of the fighters could land a decent strike again. If Oliver is able to crash forward, maybe get Belbizia up against the cage, maybe we could see her get a flurry for a TKO. But again, I, I do think this is going to go to a decision. And for that reason, I do ever so slightly have Maria Oliveira in this matchup. I think she is going to be the one to initiate some of these striking exchanges. And if that's the case, not that I think she's going to put on a masterclass by any means uh, whatsoever. I just think she's going to be able to edge out a lot of these rounds. But all three of these rounds are probably going to be razor thin. And a big right cross that you'll see out of Maria Oliveira when she fights. She utilizes that Muay Thai clinch really well. Knees to the body. That's kind of her strong suit is Oliveira. Whereas for Belbizia, when she gets into the clinch, she looks to just kind of press that body weight up there, look for a takedown, and then on the break, she's able to land a lot of really good shots. I think the leg kick of Belbizia is going to do a good job in this matchup and kind of deter Oliveira from advancing into some of those flurries. So I'm actually going with the Warrior Princess Diana Belbizia in the match 
matchup. Let us know down below in the comments section who you have in this fight. A big time card headlined by Amanda Nunes taking on Irina Aldana. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Dvorak is back and he's looking to get back into the win column after dropping his first two fights in a row in his entire pro MMA career. Gone is the 16 fight win streak for the man out of the Czech Republic and in on short notice steps Astro Boy Steven Erseg out of Australia. He's from Perth, Western Australia. Just an MMA hotbed all of a sudden. And he's a guy that represents Wilkes MMA but he also cross trains at Scrappy and you know Scrappy for Jack Della Maddalena but one 70 so a lot of great things going on on the west coast a place where you romero kissed luke rockhold he in did. the mouth they had an intimate moment in front of all of us ufc 221 but when i look at this matchup matt i mean if you know steven erseg well you probably do i mean it's not crazy and outside of the realm of possibility that you already recognize him because he fought with hex he's seven and oh with eternal he is their flyweight champ a little bit of experience here and there at Bantamweight. And I think the craziest thing out of Astro Boy's overall career is that already established as a pro, he somehow competes in amateur matches at GAMMA, the Global Mixed Martial Arts Organization Tournament. And I'll throw it up there because in 2019, he goes through the tournament. At the end, he fights fellow UFC flyweight. Now, all of a sudden, Dennis Bondar, old psycho. And in that one, Erseg loses. And if you go and you look at some of the pictures, I found one on Steven's uh, face. Facebook page they're wearing like the big gloves and they're wearing the shin pads as well so it's not like we're going out there and landing elbows or anything yeah. crazy so Steven doesn't get it done there but that's all right because that's a pretty darn good fighter but as a pro for Erseg I went down through and watched every single fight in meticulous order and for me it really surprised me he's got two really big names on his pro record one win over with Hex against the former or the recent road to UFC finalist uh, and that is Sungguk Choi who wasn't able to get it o done over Park and in that one first round fairly competitive round two round three it is Erseg taking it down to the mat and just controlling overall and if you look at it for Erseg when he wins his eternal flyweight strap he beats Shannon Ross and he finishes him by rear naked choke drops him with a right hand and then gets down on the ground and gets that submission win there's so many positives to go through it with Steven Erseg. He's going to be one of the biggest flyweights you're ever going to find at 5'9". But the craziest part about it, for as big and as muscular and as powerful as Erseg is with his takedowns, he marches guys down in almost a square stance. He drops back on the center line and drops his hands every time. And I can count it on two hands the amount of times Erseg's been dropped by right hands against his opponents. But by the Jeepers, he's got nine wins. He he's one of those bend but don't break kind of guys. He's like the Colts defense when they had Peyton Manning. Because when Erseg is able to land his own strikes, and if you just watch them in a vacuum and kind of eliminate some of the strikes he's absorbing, he's not like a terrible striker. Like he's Re not some negative striker on the really, feet. Really, really good inside leg exactly. kick. He attacks the calf on the outside. Too. And a good right hand too, and he's able to land it straight. He can land it as a hook too. And that's why I do think he's a very dangerous fight for Dvorak to be taking. Because David doesn't really have to take this fight at this stage of his I guess maybe he does well, because he's lost two in a row, no, but still, no. this is a guy who, to a lot of MMA fans, is still kind of a, a known commodity in the division. And that's because this fight was originally supposed to be Mateus, or sorry, not Mateus, it was supposed to be Matt Schnell, who's ranked 8th against the number 10, David Dorjak, and ultimately Schnell's out of the fight, and Erseg, who was supposed to fight Clayton Carpenter a few weeks ago, now Erseg gets a shot against a 10th rank fighter in a big division. This is what I really like about this fight, though. Steve is a guy, or Steven, sorry, is a guy who's going to move forward and really pressure David Dvorak in this matchup. David's one of these fighters, so it really comes down to how does he deal with that pressure, because if he is able to mix his martial arts, throw the jab out there to kind of blind him, go for the takedowns, be dominant in that top position, I can see him winning this fight but in some of David's fights we have seen when he's on the back foot when he's forced to make those decisions in fast time when he's not the one leading the dance he will freeze he will have that deer and headlight syndrome and if we see him get cracked by a big right hand I wouldn't be surprised now saying he gets submitted is a bit of a stretch right like David Dvorak is a very talented grappler in his own right but still if Erseg's able to get his back and just get into some of those dominant positions it's going to make David Dvorak that much less likely to try to implement his own wrestling as this fight continues and Dvorak's the guy who when he implements all of his game that's when it all 
hell really opens up. When he's forced to just strike, when he's forced to just wrestle, that's when he does put out these limited performances. And Dvorak's one of those guys that you saw the 16 fight win streak. You saw him get to the top of the mountain with Octagon before he came into the UFC. He's so fast. He I is. mean, he's lightning fast. And you look at the last two losses. He gets dropped by that creepy, and, and I mean creepy, he gets put on skates against Mateus Nicolau like it was Jamal Crawford who was just landing crossovers. Nicolau can bang, though, to be fair. In the NBA. And so Nicolau's able to land that big shot against Dvorak. He kind of wobbles back. And after that, he rallies, and it's not so bad, but he ultimately ends up losing that fight. And then he goes out there against Manel Kopp, and he gets hit quite a few times to the fact that he's behind the black lines, Cops really pressuring him. And Dvorak, other than having good wrestling in that fight, wasn't able to really implement his offensive striking. So if you do go down through it, you look at both of these guys. For Dvorak, very well-rounded. Speed's a uh, big advantage. He definitely has the volume advantage in a fight like this because... Erceg will throw the jab out there a little bit. He will throw the leg kicks, as I had mentioned, and he will throw a really nice right cross. And every now and again, he'll set himself up and wait and bait and then throw that nice left hook. You saw that when he fought Paul Loga in a fight where Loga, and sorry, he fought Paul Loga twice, the first Loga fight. Loga goes overhand right and it lands on Steven's chin. He goes overhand right and it lands on Steven's chin. He does it three times. And Steven, bend but don't break. He stands up and then he ultimately lands that left hook. That is his only knockout win. So for me, Erceg's one of those guys, like we had Jesse Butler coming in on short notice last weekend against Jim Miller. I don't think Erceg's out like a fish out of water like Butler was against Miller. That was a, Unless you're a top 15 fighter, you can't beat Jim Miller on two yeah, days notice. That, that was a Thursday call-in to fight on Saturday. And thank goodness for Butler, he made the weight, but I thought he was dead. And I yelled and woke up the dogs and my Just wife. But like, Jim Miller's still what, that guy. Yeah, when it comes down to this matchup, again, Erceg, he got dropped by Tim Moore. He got outstruck by Mark Familiari before he got the fight down to the mat. The fight that he had against Cody Haddon was at Bantamweight after quite a bit of a time away. And in that one, even though Cody Haddon's 2-0, those two guys train together now. So that's pretty cool. Saw that on uh, the Instagram of Erceg. But in that matchup, that was a fight of the night. It was back and forth. Haddon's really landing on Erceg. Erceg has to rally back again. And in the third round, it really was all Erceg. I scored at 29-28 for Erseg. And then his last time out against uh, Soichiro Hirai. Hirai, familiar, or, or kind of looked a lot like Dvorak on the outside. He's kind of lunging around. He is a southpaw. And then he tries to duck in for a punch. And as he ducks, then Steven's able to go in there, grab the back, pull the fight down to the mat. It was a bodyweight takedown. And Erseg gets the submission. So out of this one, I definitely think that Erseg is the better grappler. And that might sound silly if you go back and watch that those Dvorak performances. When he was with Octagon, he was a king of the scrambles. We just haven't seen it in the UFC, but... But I think for Erceg, size-wise, performance-wise, with all of the submission wins and the fact that he holds guys down. He, does. he doesn't he doesn't let them get back up other than the Haddon fight, who's really gone on to do some nice things. So I think this is a really good fight. Dvorak is a slight favorite in the matchup. I'm really eager to see what the fans are thinking on Topology for a total vote. I'll let you set the total on this one. I think Dvorak's going to be favored by 70% of the fans. I'm going to say over 70%, and it is wow. over. So 457 total votes, 85% Dvorak, 79% by decision for the 15% that I've ever said predictably, 51% by decision, 44% by submission. And for me, Matt, going back through, watching all the tape, I mean, Steven Erseg. Going out to fight a Bantamweight fight against Haddon had a shirt that said flyweights are friends, not food. I think the Clayton Carpenter fight would have been good. I think the Carpenter fight would have been good as well. I, I like Erceg, and he's a welcome addition to the UFC. I think for me, he's going to struggle with the speed of David Dvorak on the outside. The movement of a guy like Dvorak, I could be wrong. But I do think Dvorak's going to be out there and having success with his strikes in this matchup. I have Dvorak in this fight, and I'm going to zag a little bit on one thing you said. I think Erisic can be the better grappler if he gets the top position. I do think Dvorak can get the top spot and maybe out-wrestle Erisic in some positions. And I'm not saying he's going to for, you know, minutes at a time. Erisic's a very dangerous fighter on the ground, but I still think David can go in there and implement his wrestling attack without being in complete fear of just, like, the Flores-Lava type well, situation. And, and that was it. The fight that uh, Erisic had against Tim Moore, there were a lot of 
of wizard throws and more looked like he was gonna have success with the grappling and he didn't the only guy in the pro career other than sean gauchi over with hex who is still a hex champ right now to this moment so that's a that's a forgivable loss on the record of a guy like Erseg. but the only other guy that had success with the grappling was cody Haddon again he was able to mount offensive takedowns he ran out of steam in the third round but there's no sweat in that both of us going with the undertaker david dvorak in the matchup a big time fight really want to hear from you down below in the comments section on this one it should be a lot of fun at flyweight some big fights on the card including charles Oliveira taking on benil dariush in the co-main event you're not going to want to miss it keep it locked in with fighting apex we always say let's, let's get, get into, into it, it. The Canadians, they're here. Do you think Kyle Nelson drinks maple syrup before the fights like we do? I hope not, because that was an awful experience, I must say. It really was, but coming up this weekend, we have the monster Kyle Nelson taking on El Animal. It is Blake, a builder representing Subfighter and Old Fuego Boxing down there in California. For Builder, a CFFC champ and a, a really turning into a great pro oh, yeah. at a bit of a later age. I mean, he's in his early 30s. He's not in his early 20s. But he's really seemed to put everything together and we saw that in his performance down in Australia's last time out Against smoking Shane Young out of New Zealand and in that one. How was his gas tank, Craig? It was pretty nice. It was good. really good It was really good. It surprised me a lot because for Builder you kind of saw him make that progression with CFFC He takes on a short notice opponent in his first title fight over there against Frank Buenafuente who went from fighting on the prelims to a title shot and he got dropped in that fight, and then he rallied back. That was a beautiful submission, though. Then Builders, next time out, he fights Carvalho, and he gets dropped not once, but twice. And then he rallies back, and he wins. So then he takes on Tristars. Alex Morgan, a guy who I'm going to reference later on in these fights. Sure, and Alex in that Morgan. matchup, Blake Builder goes out there, has some success. He's able to slip a shot, and then he ends up jumping onto the back of Alex Morgan after he has him rocks, rocked. He gets the submission win. Dana White says, I don't hire 32-year-olds, but ultimately, Builder ends up in the UFC. And against Shane Young, it wasn't one hit, one kill wrestling or jiu-jitsu, or striking, but we got to see a little bit of a progression of the skills of a guy like Blake Builder. And that was really nice to see, because you knew that he did have sort of the individual skill sets, but it was a matter of, hey, can he finally put it all together? And like you said, guys in 32 normally don't keep on progressing, right? Like, you're a finished product, and we'll just kind of see where you go from this point on. But for Builder, it does seem like he is continuing to grow fight after fight, and that's an exciting thing, too, because if he is able to grow, even based on the last performance against Shane Young, then he might be able to make himself into... Well, uh, Josh Emmett's a pretty good example. Example, right? Like Josh Emmett was able to go on a big run in his 30s, right? He wasn't really this known commodity. He thought about retiring multiple times before he made it to the UFC. And then he hit on this run after getting these crazy knockouts. I'm not saying Builder is going to get to the level of the division like a Josh Emmett, but still, I, there's guys out there who kind of progress later on in life. And I do think Builder could be one of those fighters. And for Kyle Nelson, it's just been such a weird run, right? Like every Kyle Nelson fight, he'll look kind of okay. The pressure might be there. The boxing combinations, he'll get hit a lot, which isn't phenomenal. And that's the thing B about both these guys. Both of these guys, and I have it in my notes. Funny fight because both guys' faults are similar. They've shown wobbly exactly. moments in fights, but more often than not, they withstand adversity and, and overcome. Th that's why this fight does remind me a little bit of the opening fight on the card between Belbizia and Oliveira because it really does come down to whoever's moving forward because if Builder has Nelson up against the cage, I'd like him to strike in combination. I'd like him to threaten with the takedown too. And like you mentioned with Builder, he's a really talented back taker. That's what he's looking for in a lot of these grappling situations. He'll threaten with the arm bar. He'll look for different positions but a lot of it is to try to open up you kind of getting to your base he can take the back and from that position I mean he has rear naked choke finishes he has good ground and pound too when he is able to get in that top spot but the thing is that might be the hardest way to beat a guy like Kyle Nelson right like if Blake Builder goes out there hits him with a few big shots and knocks him out that's one thing but if Builder goes and tries to out wrestle him he could find himself getting fatigued and we could see Kyle Nelson kind of fighting himself into this one well when we talk about Kyle Nelson representing host of champions he's cornered Diana Belbizia in the past in the UFC see he's also got Mike Malott training out of that gym who's taking on Adam Fuget later on, on this card and if you look at it for a guy like Kyle Nelson I mean overall also training with St. John New Brunswick's own Christian Savoie so Shut pretty up. cool over there but if you look at a guy like Nelson it's bringing the boxing together you saw him on two days notice fight up a weight class against Carlos Diego Ferreira and he loses in the strike and he gets taken down in the first round and ground out. And then in the second round, he gets finished. He takes on Matt Sales. And I know you said that if 
you know, this fight's going to come down to whoever pressures. Sales completely outstruck Nelson on the outside by backing around and just turning because Nelson doesn't necessarily do a great job of cutting the cage. He keeps his hands really high. He moves in kind of spooky like that. And he throws a lot of really big, like, hooks and punches from distance to try and close the distance, whereas foot position isn't the biggest thing for Kyle Nelson. And that's where he can get peppered with a lot of counters. So he has struggled in those moments. He did finish Kama Worthy. That was an interesting fight. Or, sorry, Polo, Polo Reyes. Polo Reyes got where finished by everybody. He hit him with so many shots in that flurry. And that one was in Mexico, so a big win for Kyle Nelson there. He then goes on to lose a couple in a row. One to Billy Quarantillo that's forgivable. One to Jai Herbert, where Nelson started out really strong in the first round with the leg kicks his boxing looked good and then slowed down round two round three and his last time out against duho Choi, it's a weird one because just about everybody scored at 29 27 Choi because Choi lost the point in the third round just like muen gafurov did last weekend except Choi from in tight on top in the third ducks down and his head clashed with kyle nelson's head and war tyone goes no i'm not war tyone in this Nah, nah, you're losing a point for that headbutt. I thought it was a little crazy. Ultimately, it ends up as a draw because two of the judges scored at 28-28 and 129-27. But for Kyle Nelson, now you're in a weird spot because Nelson in the fight against Choi excelled in his wrestling in the he third did. round. I know I just said Choi was on top and landed the headbutt. It's true, but Nelson was winning the third, losing the first and losing the second. In my own view i guess i mean in that second round obviously the round was scored for nelson by two of the judges but i just i disagree a little bit but when you look at a matchup like this i think builder can have some success in the wrestling i think he can have some success in the striking but that right hand to kyle nelson or even both of those hooks those could cause builder issues the right hand's been an issue for builder to try and see it around his guard so i'll be eager to see what we get out of builder in this one this is first time up in canada you mentioned that in an you interview. You hate it though a guy's best chance to win is when he's talking like a 1920s boxer. This big right hand though. Like, hey, if that's what you're relying on, I do think the volume of Builder, and you bring it up. Yes, I agree with you. Nelson can get countered because he doesn't really uh, cut off the cage well. But still, if you're Blake Builder, you'd much rather be moving forward in this matchup, I would say, than moving backwards. Because it still does give Nelson the opportunity to land one of those big hooks if he is able to bob and weave his way through some of those combinations. Yeah, I mean, Builder did say in an interview with Combat Sports UK and James Lynch, he said... Going to 10th planet quite a bit uh, with everybody. The open mats, so you never know what actual jiu-jitsu yeah. rank they are in a gi. And he said 15 rounds, 6 minutes straight with 30 seconds in between. And he feels like the Terminator, so that's kind of scary. Builder is a big favorite in the matchup. We have a look at the topology votes. Surprised us there to you. I'm going to say over under 75% Builder. I'll say over. It's just uh, Kyle Nelson's 1-4 of four it has with a draw a on the UFC. It's 94% wow. of 822 total votes going with Builder, 41% by decision, 40% by submission for the 6% that have Nelson, 43% by decision, 39% by knockout. I do have Builder in the matchup, but getting knocked down and almost out by fighters that are no sniff close to the UFC, it obviously does scare quite a bit. I will go with Builder because I like that progression that I saw. Even with the 20-hour flight and the jet lag that he had going to Australia, I still like Builder in the matchup here. I also have Builder in this fight. I was really impressed by the volume in his last fight against Shane Young. That really stood out to me because he was able to strike forwards and backwards. And I think that's going to really be the key in this matchup against Nelson. So both of us going with Blake Builder. Both of us going with Builder who has a closer flight to Vancouver than Kyle Nelson does out of Ontario an interesting fight coming up and listen when we're talking about the featherweights they're on fire you got a title fight not so far away with Rodriguez taking Ooh. on Volkanovski and the co-main event of this card Matt you get Charles Oliveira taking on Benil Darius at lightweight you're not going to want to miss it keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. Bantamweight finishers put win streaks on the line. Coming up this weekend, we have Montreal, Quebec, Canada's own Eamon Zahabi taking on, it's so aggressive, the Mongolian murderer. It's Arichi Lang. And when you look at a matchup like this, Matt, for Arichi Lang, I mean, he had a fight of the night debut when he took on Jeff Molina. He got dropped twice in the second round. In the third round, he rallied back. And then he loses again against one heck of a wrestler in Cody Durden, but wins over Cameron Else. And then Jay Perrin has set him up well against Eamon Zahabi, who beat Draco Rodriguez a really long time ago, knocked him out in that fight with the right hand. And then his last time out beat 
You know what I'm saying? Hadouken, Ricky Tertios. And why do I have that pause? It's because for Ricky Tertios, he landed on 27 of 235 significant strikes. That's about 11%. And that fight for Zahabi was back in July of last year. And for Zahabi, there hasn't been a lot of activity. And I listened to an interview that he did with La Reina in French. And he said that basically... You know, there's been a lot of injuries, and that's why he hasn't competed. He had twins, so that really caused him some issues. But he also said, and it, this is kind of an interesting thing, that he's not really going with Faraz as his manager anymore. I hope he didn't say, I had twins, they caused me so many issues. No, no, I hope no, he was no, no, excited no. about but it. But that was the reason why he couldn't fight all that much. But Faraz was kind of in charge of the fight bookings. Now he's aligned himself with Daniel Rubenstein of Ruby Sports, so... It's got to be weird when your brother owns bit. the gym and now you're like, well, I got Daniel, who's a hell of a manager out there. So Eamon wants to be active. He wants to fight two or three times a year. And the best part of the interview was, and he said this and I quote, Il veut que je fais des choses extraordinaires à cause de mon nom. And that means that people and the fans want him to do extraordinary things because of his name. And we haven't seen that in the UFC. We, we saw that knockout win over Draco Rodriguez where it's a little bit of an overhand right as Rodriguez is coming in. And we saw that exact same strike against Vieira, who was an Ultimate Fighter winner, where we were there in attendance in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, when Zahabi made his UFC debut. But before he came to the UFC, he was 6-0 and with six first-round finishes. And I think that's what the fans want to see. Not necessarily it's because it's Faraz's brother. It's because Eamon's career started off so quick. I think people still know him for his And the train more. hasn't really been on the tracks ever since then. I just think with Zahabi, if you look at a lot of his skill set, just kind of look at it in bits and flashes, he's a talented fighter, like you bring up. He's a good striker moving backwards. He's really good at timing his power shots and with some of his volume strikes. But the thing is, he's never really been able to throw the whole entire skill set together. Like, he he wrestled a little bit in Halifax, I remember, and then we've just never really seen him overly use the wrestling. And that's the thing about Archie Lang, too. He'll wrestle in some fights where he'll win, and then he'll get out wrestled in other fights. And that's been the frustrating thing, because for Archie Lang, when he is mixing in his own wrestling with his striking, he becomes so much more of a threat on the feet. We've seen it open up his game so much more, but when he's the guy on the back foot being taken down, it forces him to be so much more hesitant with his hands, and we just don't really see the whole package of his game. And I mean, it's a hobby. It seems to be almost like an analysis analysis paralysis type situation it's what skill set do i go with because they're both or all i guess i should say i was going to say strike and grappling but they're all so polished for a guy like Zahabi. and he really noted in that interview and i was glad to hear what he had to say because he picked up on the fact that a richie line when he's moving forward he never fights with a jab he always fights with the right, right hand and he also struggles with the grappling when it's defensive but offensive he saw on his regional scene career that was the hallmark of his game so the tie-in is for Zahabi. He's training with a lot of fighters at 135, and I'll throw it up there. He's training with Xavier Alaoui, who was a champ over with the UAE Warriors at a time. He's training with Saeed Yakub Kakrakmanov, who they brought in specifically for this fight. And he's also training with a guy who fights with the big right hand, Alex Morgan, who fought Blake Builder, uh, you know, on Dana White's Contender Series. And he's really doing the damn thing with Samurai right now in Quebec. So for Zahabi, kind of an all-star camp right now. For Arichi Long, you've seen him out of a couple of different gyms. Most recently, Fight Ready MMA with uh, another guy that kind of represents Inner Mongolia. And we're talking about Alatang Hei Li. But for Arichi Long, these last couple of fights, he's really, really bit down on the mouthpiece and yes. become that offensive guy again, where he hasn't had to worry about defending the take downs like he did against Molina and against Cody Durden. So we've seen it all hang out for Arichi Long and that's what I think makes this fight a lot of fun. And that's why I worry about Zahabi's tendency to back up because I think that's going to allow Archie Lang to use his wrestling a little bit more because if Zahabi's up against the cage, that's where Archie Lang will go for takedowns. He kind of does get stuck in some positions. He's not a guy like a prime Cain Velasquez or Daniel Cormier where it's like one hit, one kill from that sport. But if Zahabi does find himself backed up against the cage trying to find his big power shot, that's going to allow Archie Lang to really start implementing takedowns and that's why I brought them up so early in the video because if we do see Zahabi back up I just think that's going to help Archie Lang with that part of his game and if he is able to start wrestling with Zahabi well like you say Zahabi's a guy who is going to really go out there and think the game he's gonna have to add those extra kind of half seconds to his thought process if he now does have to worry about the takedown attempt and the knockout strikes as well and Archie Lang kind of similar to a fighter that we saw last weekend Felipe Linz moves down from heavyweight to light heavyweight three and oh Archie Lang oh and two at flyweight so he moves up the fan and weight now now he's 2-0, exactly. so crazy to see right there. You look at the odds in the matchup. Arichi Lang is the slight favorite. And Matt, you want some Mongolian trivia? 
shoot the yeah. actual real mccoy country of uh, mongolia i watched a video yesterday by real life lore 99.7 percent of mongolia is uninhabited it's all pretty centralized over there crazy Don't climates they still have like a nomadic tribe i'm pretty I'm, sure I'm it's sure the only country plenty, that does but there are there there are crazy weather conditions in mongolia arichilong is from inner mongolia an autonomous region of northern china just next door to it but if we have a look at the topology votes on this one a little nugget for the fans out Shut there out. um i'm gonna say over under six 67.5% are going with our Richie Long here. I'll say over. That I'll must be a long over. flight to get to it's Vancouver. under. So 802 total votes, 64% are Richie Long, 62% by decision. For the 36% that it was a hobby, 79% by decision. Who do you have here? I wouldn't be surprised if Zahabi is able to win this fight because I do think Archie Lang and the recklessness in which he closed the distance is going to open up some of those big counter shots for a guy like Zahabi. But I do think the consistency of Archie Lang, if he is able to get that forward pressure, is going to be able to win him a decision. Again, I think this should be a pretty close fight. It should be an entertaining fight because, again, Archie Lang's the guy who's going to move forward. He's going to create those engagements. But I ever so slightly have him in this fight. I do too, and I don't love it because for Archie Lang, he's got one of those games where it's all offense. There's not a lot of defense behind it and for Zahabi he's got that champ camp behind him right now like Cockrock Manov, Aloui, Morgan those are all good fighters to have training with you I would not be surprised in the slightest if Zahabi got the win coming up this weekend but both of us going with the inner Mongolian Aruchi Long to get the win let us know down below in the comments section if you have the Quebec or Ayman Zahabi or if it is Aruchi Long some big fights left on this card including Nunes who's taking on Aldana a new matchup at Bantamweight in the main event keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks we always say let's, let's get, get into it. it with respect to Lauren Murphy and Jessica Andrade and all the other women chasing Valentina Shevchenko I can sit here and tell you late in 2020 I believe Miranda Maverick is the second best women's flyweight in the world coming up this weekend flyweight we grapplers meet in Vancouver. We have St. Catharines, Ontario's own. It's Jasmine Jastavizia. She's going to be taking on Fear the Miranda Maverick, repping Colorado as it stands, training at a pound for pound Muay Thai with some pretty darn good fighters. And we've seen Coach Justin Houghton really up on a pedestal, really doing great work with the men and women that are training out of that region of Colorado. And for Maverick, you see an improvement in the striking, but you also see a bevy of training partners in the weight classes. We've seen her train with Raquel Pennington, who's going to be the backup for the main event coming up this weekend between Aldana and one Amanda Nunes. But if I do focus in on this matchup, Matt, I have a bit of a hard time. You know why? Why? Because I'm 0-3 in picking Jasmine Jazavizius fights in the UFC. I thought Kay Hansen would get the win. It didn't happen. I thought that Jazavizius was then going to beat Natalia Silva. Boy, was I wrong. And then There's I picked... a Venn diagram out there with Kennedy and Zechku and <laughs> Jasmine Jazavizius. And you're the only person in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah. It's a sad place <laughs> to be and I don't enjoy it. So I want to get this one right. But for Jazavizius, oh. her last time out there against a the former LFA champ, Fernandez, I remember in the video we said, okay, Jasmine, really good at wrestling. Struggles with the striking from the outside. We saw that against Natalia Silva. Gabriella struggles with the takedowns, but she's really good on the outside. And what happened in that fight? Well, wrestling won out to the tune of a 30-26 for Jasmine Jazz Divizia. So when it does come down to this matchup, I, I like the social media channels are just flooded with Jasmine Chazavizius uh, content. She does a really good job of marketing herself out there. Go ahead. I have a baseball comp for you for Miranda Maverick. Oh boy. Is Miranda Maverick Jason Hayward? Miranda Maverick a giant contract had and ins- ages through it. Miranda- Jason Hayward was an all-star in his rookie season. Had a lot of hype coming into the league and was thought of as, hey, a versatile defender in the outfield who but could get done hit. at the plate too. Well, he could hit though for a few seasons. Has an OPS plus of 102. I just looked it up. But for Miranda Maverick, she was kind of the princess that was promised, if you will, right? Like, Do you, you think that's up- why I started with that well, audio intro? I bring it up every time Miranda Maverick fights though. Like Miranda Maverick was thought of as the next great prospect in a division that has kind of had a lot of next great things. It's like in the NBA for a long time. Kobe Bryant worked out perfect because he came right after Michael Jordan and everyone was trying to be like Mike, right? Everybody was looking for the next Valentina Shevchenko. Who's going to finally dethrone the champion? And I feel like we were kind of crowning these contenders before they really made it up to the top. And unfortunately for Miranda Maverick, it's no discredit to her. She's still a very talented fighter. It's just she was thought of as kind of the next in line for the title. And she just hasn't really been able to realize that peak yet. But to her credit, she's still only 25 years old, turning 26 soon. But still, a young fighter who can continue to progress. And you got to kind of rein it in a little bit. When you look at somebody like Miranda Maverick, 4-2 and two in the UFC, she beat 
beat Shani Young quite soundly in their rematch. That was her last fight. Worked in the takedowns, was able to really hold things and kind of stall it out. I know it's not the best fight to go back and watch. She submitted Sabina Mazel before that. You look at the two-fight losing streak for Maverick in the UFC. She loses to some pretty darn good exactly. fighters. I mean, if you consider it right now, Macy Barber's ranked 11th in the division. Majority of people thought that Maverick had won that fight. And then before that, a loss to Aaron Blanchfield, who's now ranked number four, <laughs> and it's kind of the heir apparent to the next title pretty shot. Good. So you got to kind of take those losses for what they are. For Jazz Davizius, again, she loses to Natalia Silva, who looks like another top contender. You imagine a fight between Natalia Silva and Manoff Fioro. Wouldn't that That'd be, be a, a lot of fun? One. It would be. So when it does come down to this one, I know for Jazz and Jazz Davizius, 2016 silver medalist, yeah, Canadian wrestling champ was Jasmine and in the fights that she's had. And this is why I really have a hard time with it. I go back and I watch Jazz Vizzi's fight with Elise Reed to get ready for last weekend. And what happens in that fight? Jasmine gets some takedowns. Jasmine starts to reach with a lot of her punches. And Elise is able to circle out of the way, land a lot of kicks, land a lot of punches on the outside. And it's a lot of Jasmine just trying to, to circle and chase for the majority of the fight. Jasmine, to her credit, you look at that 50-odd second knockout that she has with BTC and she lands every single good shot that she will land throughout a fight. She lands a right hand. She lands a jab. She lands the inside kick. She gets into the clinch. She lands really good knees. All in the span of under a minute. Those are all the things that you can look forward to out of Jazz Avizius. And by and large, her cardio is quite good. I know getting ready for this fight, she trains with Anthony Romero at Niagara Top Team. She's trained with Mike Malott in the past as well. They feature heavily on the social medias. But when I look at a matchup like this, I'll be interested to see Jasmine's fought Southpaws in the past. Her last opponent, Fernandez, was a Southpaw. Natalia Silva will switch stances. Miranda Maverick is a Southpaw. This fight really does come down to... The body kick out of Miranda Maverick and Southpaw, the right cross of Jasmine when that lead hand gets up there. And those are two big weapons for both these fighters in every single one of their fights. You have the clinch, though, for Jazz Davicius. I think Maverick can have success in that position, too. Her elbows on the inside are very effective, and that's why a lot of people were so hyped up about her after a UFC debut. I just think that's a position that both fighters can have success in, where it's not just cut and dry. Oh, if it's in this spot, Jasmine should be able to win a lot of them. And that's why I think it should make for an interesting fight, because on the outside, both fighters should be able to have success personally I favor Maverick slightly with her outside striking because if she's able to land that jab and some of her kicks from the outside that's just going to help her accumulate numbers in her favor from that position and I think it will force Jasmine to start reaching a little bit further for those takedowns because if Jasmine's not able to start getting her own long distance striking going I think it is going to really force her to be okay I'm really going to have to start going for it with her wrestling and if that is the version of her we do get I think it might be hard for her to sort of make up for it in the numbers if she's not able to get convincing takedowns over Maverick and Jazz Davizius recently in this camp getting her BJJ brown belt at Niagara top team with coach Matt DiMarcantonio, Matt Allen. We saw Matt DiMarcantonio in a main event in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada fighting Dan Gibbon. Dan Gibbon. He had a losing record and he got finished and then Matt DiMarcantonio held a pose for a really long he time did. as I tried to get my phone out to take pictures. It was very awkward to a crowd of few. But the Allen brothers are there. Matt, when it does come down to the matchup, Maverick is favored to get the win in the fight. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise us there to you. I'm 0-3 in picking Jazz Davizius fights. I'm going to say over under 80% Maverick. I think it'll be over. And it is over slightly. 823 total votes, 85% Maverick. Large majority out of the fans with either side. Picking the fight to go to a decision. Give me Miranda Maverick. Again, I do think the kicks are going to play out a yeah. big factor for Maverick in this fight, opening up from the southpaw stance. Jazz Vizius, again, she's got to walk in there to close that distance, which seems silly because she's taller and longer. But if you do watch a lot of the tape, maybe you'll come to the same conclusion as I did. I fear the Miranda Maverick. The Invicta Phoenix Series Rising 2 winner. Maverick. I love tournaments, but those don't get me fired up at all. I have Miranda Maverick in the matchup, though. Again, you bring up her losses to good fighters. Aaron Blanchfield's probably going to fight for a title, what, in the next 12 to 18 months? There's probably a pretty good chance of it. So I do have Maverick in this matchup. I just like the completeness of her game. And again, I bring up her age for a reason. At 25 years old, I do think she can still continue to make those improvements throughout her career. Both of us going with Maverick. Maverick in the matchup, so you can't call us Canadian homers in this one. We picked against one. the majority of them, I feel we like. Have so far, yeah, yeah, we have so far, actually. So make sure you check out those videos and try and get those special Canadianity things. But, Matt, it should be a big-time card. Nunes taking on Aldana in the main event. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it.
Get ready for it. It's a big time middleweight fight coming up this weekend. We have number 12 versus number 14. It's the sniper Nasruddin Imavov. He's going to be taking on action man Chris Curtis. And it's got to be a little bit awkward coming into this fight. Because for Imavov, he's supposed to fight Kelvin Gaslam in a main event. Out is Gaslam in on short notice. At 205 pounds, it was a light heavyweight fight. He fights one half of the Man Dance podcast, Sean Strickland. And in that one, Strickland, 204. Nasty Imovov, 194, and it looked like it. And in that one, Imovov couldn't get a striking going on the outside. And what makes it more awkward is the other half of the Man Dance podcast was in the corner of Sean Strickland. It's the action man, Chris Curtis. So Curtis, who's done one camp with Strickland to get ready for Imovov, although abbreviated, extremely abbreviated, now he gets the opportunity to implement the game plan against Imovov. And what I found really interesting for Curtis was between round two and round three, Curtis asked for Strickland to throw... The two and the three is the combo with the, the, he called it a toe kick. For Curtis, you'll see that a lot out of him in that southpaw stance. He'll throw the two and the three quite a bit. He won't, he will jab a lot, but he will mention that and he will throw that left straight, mix it up with the right hook. And that's where Curtis, once he starts to get rolling and he's moving forward, you see it against Vieira, you see it in his win against Brennan Allen. When he lands those powerful strikes, kind of freezes a lot of guys. Oh, yeah. For Imovov, who relies a lot on his movement, if he freezes... Well, that's really it for him. So when you look at this fight, Matt, I mean, Curtis, a striker, a boxer that doesn't throw a lot of kicks. For Imavov, a kickboxer that doesn't throw a lot of kicks. Neither one of these guys throw a ton of kicks in their own merit, but they do both like to do it with the hands, albeit in completely different styles. With Imavov bouncing a lot on the outside with low hands, and Chris Curtis, Philly shell all the time and mixing that jab in with the 2-3 combo. And that's, I have a really hard time with this fight for many reasons. We've seen both versions of both guys, right? Like, we've seen different versions of both guys. And I guess for Chris Curtis, it always does come down to who the matchup is, right? It feels like he excels against guys who are kind of like the ally Quinta build, if you will. If you're really good at wrestling, but you're a bit of a limited striker, well, Chris Curtis can defend all your takedowns, force you to be that limited striker, he's probably going to knock you out because he does have really heavy hands for being an undersized middleweight. And I do think he is undersized for the weight class. Like, you don't look at him at middleweight and think, wow, this guy's overpowered powering a ton of fighters. Look at the Hadolfo fight, like, even against Calvin Gaslam. Calvin Gaslam's on a big 185, or a guy who used to fight at 170. They're pretty similar in stature for the weight class, so it will be interesting to see how the physicality of a guy like Imovov is going to play into this fight, because you bring it up. Imovov isn't really, like, a 205-er. He's a big guy for 185. I don't think he ever would fight at 205. And we kind of saw that based on his way in, and I, I guess he was kind of getting ready for a 185 fight, so be that for what it is. Maybe he could have uh, shown up near 205. Sean Strickland was riding dirt bikes today before he accepted Sean it. Strickland's a mystery. That guy makes no sense at all. But for Imovov, he was still able to throw on the back foot in that fight. And I know the volume did end up playing in Sean Strickland's favor, but Sean Strickland's kind of an outlier with his volume in the middleweight division. He's not a guy who's going to really hurt you with a ton of shots, but he's going to throw 15, 16, 17 punch combos, it feels like. So I'll be curious to see if Chris Curtis is able to move forward and at least threaten with his boxing combinations because I don't think he's going to be able to throw the same kind of volume as a guy like Sean Strickland. But if he is able to get on the inside of those strikes of Imovov, I like the body shots of Chris Curtis. I think those are something we're going to see a lot of and if he's able to use that right hook to the body and then respond with the left hook up top that's the combination that Chris Curtis has a lot of success with. Curtis is one of those guys I mean already 4-2 and two in the UFC he's got more bonuses he's kind of been there done that and he's had that meteoric rise off the wins over Phil Haas and Brendan Allen. Well, we and talked about him retiring before he ever came to yeah, the Yeah and again you want the tinfoil hat the MMA math I mean Curtis beat Phil Haas and Nasir Nimovov beat up Phil Haas on the feet and had him hurt but he struggled with the wrestling so you look at the two losses for both of these guys for Curtis, he gets out volume by Jack Romanson on the outside, and he loses to Kelvin Gaslam in a fight where Gaslam wins the first. Gaslam wins the second, even though there was that big clash of heads. But in the third round, Curtis fight, rallied though. in oh, the yeah. third round and really won that fight. third. So 29-28 for Gaslam, whereas for Imovov, he loses that fight against Strickland pretty handily. He won the fifth round. But this is a three-round fight, and that doesn't really play into it all that much. So you can't look into it too much. But for both of these Can guys... Can I at least say, though, what it does prove is he's not... I think his cardio has gotten better than what it was. I, I, I questioned his cardio a little bit earlier on in his career. But I do think that that round... Because he was getting beat up bad in the fourth round against Sean Strickland. And I thought it was impressive to see him rally in that fifth round. Well, and the, the thing that I struggle with in this matchup... For Chris Curtis, I mean, he goes out there. His last win was over Joaquin Buckley, who is now a welterweight. And looked pretty good at it. But yeah. when you look at a guy like Curtis, he struggles in the first round and in the second round to try and pin down Buckley. Buckley's in, Buckley's out, Buckley's in, Buckley's out. Buckley throws head kicks and then he mixes in his boxing. 
Imovov moves like that inside and outside, lower hands, because Buckley holds him really high, but Imovov doesn't kick like a guy like Buckley does, so I'll be interested to see if either guy decides he wants to kick, because we all know Chris Curtis way back when, first season of Contender Series, that head kick, knockout win, and then he doesn't get the contract, and retires, then he comes back, and then he retires again, then he comes back. I'll be interested to see which version we get, and Chris, we know you're out there, and you're watching this video Shout right out. now. When it does come down to the matchup, the odds in the fight are very close. I don't know where the topology votes are going to be. That's because I have a hard time trying to pick this one too. I'm going to say over under 65% Curtis. I think they'll be over. I think they're going to be over. It's the opposite way. 855 total votes, 59% Imavov, 86% by decision. For the 41% that have Curtis, 58% decision, 29% by the knockouts. Matt, who do you have in the matchup? Uh, I have Imavov, Chris Curtis. I'm really sorry if you're out there watching this fight. I really am. I think you have a great opportunity to win. If you get on the inside of Imavov's range and you are able to land those body shots, it's wild that I'm talking directly to him because I feel like I am. But I think... I think he does have all of the skills to go through and win this fight, but I do still think Imavov can have success on the back foot. I don't think Chris Curtis is a guy... If he makes him pay with the shots moving forward, then yes, he can win this fight. I'm just not 100% convinced that he can throw enough punches to go out there and win this fight by decision. We'll see how it plays out. Again, Chris Curtis has such a good boxing defense. Sometimes he waits in the pocket a little bit too much, or... He's able to really land that perfect counter shot and hurt his opponent. But one, two, three jabs in a row for Imovov. You got to watch out for the jab, but also the uppercut and then the straight right and the uppercut, especially when he's in the clinch position. You saw some of the things he could do to Edmund Shabazian when they fought. Mm. So I do have Imovov in the matchup, but I'm right 50-50 on this matchup. It's a great matchup. fight. Like, this should be a yeah, really entertaining I really want to hear from the fans on this one. They could completely tear us to shreds or be in agreement, but we'll see what happens on Saturday night. A big fight. At middleweight on this Vancouver card. Let us know who you have. A big time main event for the title up at the top. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Middleweight banger coming up this weekend. Got no Quebec Canada zone power bar. Mac Andre Barrio. He was the former two division TKO champ. He beat a guy from our hometown to punch his ticket to the UFC. Barrio now taking on Roll Tide. Eric Anders, ya boy, he had one of those strip fumbles because it wasn't really a strip sack in the national championship game in 2009. Take a shot every time they show that on the broadcast and you'll be dead by the end of the fight. Now I have to throw out a giant disclaimer to start this video off. I was in a music video with Eric Anders. That really happened in the world. And listen, it was a Mummy Cats music video for the song Wolverine. I love the song. Go check it out. Those guys over there like Fight Night Picks, and we like them. But Eric Anders and I were in that. But when it does come down to this matchup, He's a Matt, Cobra Kai, too. I really do mean that it's a middleweight banger, and I am jacked the F up for this fight. Because for Mac andre Barrio, does he win first rounds? Not often. He usually gives up a lot he of distance. Rally, though. And struggles his way in them. But yeah, he can rally. You look at his fight against Abu Azaitzar. You look at his fight against Oscar Piata. And that was a weird fight because that's a lone no contest on Barrio's record. Tested positive for Osterin. But if you go look at it with USADA. No, you go look at it with wow. USADA. Uh, and they said that is consistent with low-level Osterin cases with evidence of contamination. So it wasn't really his fault. But if you do consider it for Barrio... Yes, he has had a rocky road. He lost his first three fights in the UFC before that fight against Piata, but it's been more wins than losses since then. And if you consider the losses, one to Chidi and Joe Kawani, where he gets finished really early on, then a couple months later, he takes a fight against Jordan Wright and wins it. And then he lost to Fluffy Hernandez in a fight that... I never thought Badio could get out-wrestled like that, but it did happen. So for Badio, his last time out, he fights Julian Marquez. And did he rally in that fight? He did. Yeah, he lost the first round, and then he came out a winging it in the second. Aaron Anders is one of those guys, LFA champ, beats Brendan Allen, wins two fights in a row with the UFC, and then all of a sudden, two fights into a UFC career, you're fighting in Brazil against the legend in a main event in Lyoto Machida. A chintzy split decision loss in that one. It's gone up and down for Anders. Then he fought Thiago Santos, and that was a tough to watch. Anders is 7-7 seven and seven in the UFC, but if you consider it for both of these guys, so many finish wins, and that's what makes this fight a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun, but I hate to play devil's advocate a bit. I think there's a world where this fight isn't great. Nope. 
This is why I say that. Eric Anders sometimes can be on the back foot and try to level up that big left hand a little bit too much. We saw that in the Elias Theodoro fight. We have seen it throughout a lot of Anders' career. That left hand is a big weapon when he is able to land it, but he is a guy who won't necessarily throw a ton in terms of jabs. He will square himself up a little bit too much in search for that left hand. Now, what I will say is, Barrio and his move forward style should initiate a lot of the engagements between these two, and that's what I'm hoping for, and if that's the fight we do get, it should be an extremely entertaining fight, but... If Barrio does find himself a little bit hesitant in that first round, trying to work his wrestling into the match, because that's what people do forget about Eric Anders. I know he's not a black belt in terms of jiu-jitsu. 2023 first place at the IBJJF Pan Brown Belt Championships. Thank you. This has been my long point about Eric Anders, and I do bring it up in a lot of our videos. We don't always see the jiu-jitsu, but we're told about the jiu-jitsu a lot. When he, do he does have good takedown defense. He's an extremely strong athlete. I know you're going to... Roll if Tide. They show Nick Saban. Yeah, that's his name, right? If they show him one more time, I swear to God. But... Yeah, that guy did terrible things for the Dolphins. But for Eric Anders, that athleticism does really help him in the UFC. And I know it does sound like a bit of a cop-out, right? Him being good at football helps him in MMA. But it is true. Like, Eric Anders has ridiculous physical strength. My curiosity in this matchup comes down to, can Barrio use his pressure and his cardio to really force Eric Anders to fight? Because Anders, if he's kept at his own pace, does not have bad cardio at all. He will stand on the back foot. He will try to measure that big power shot. And he can last a strong three rounds. But I think Barrio can out pace him in this matchup if he does try to really go out there, put the wrestling shoes on, make it a grindy kind of a fight in that clinch. And that's why I have a hard time with this matchup because it's not easy to take Eric Anders down, but I do think that's Barrio's best chance to win this fight. Again, with Barrio, the Piata fight, the fight that I already had mentioned where his last time out, Julian Marquez, the fight that he had against the Zaitsar, even the fight that he had against Dolce Lungambula, and that's kind of my comp for this one. Dolce, does he fight behind a jab? No. Does he throw an overhand right? Yeah. And does he occasionally use his wrestling? Sometimes. And he tried to go for single and doubles against Badio. Successful in the first round. Won the first round. And then Badio was able to carry it forward through the fight. But with Eric Anders, you look at a guy like Badio coming forward at you, representing Killcliffe with some of the bigger, better guys in the world of MMA. A lot of Bellator guys over there, like the Steve Maurys and the Linton Vassells of the world. But if you look at it for Anders, you got a two and a three. Just like that Strickland combo. Badio is going to fight with a straight right and then he fights with a big left hook and he closes distance, closes distance, crashes forward, gets you up behind the black line and then he unleashes in that clinch and you saw that against the War Master, or not, the War Hammer the War Master's Josh Burnett who's on I think you should leave season 3 the War Hammer is Adam Hunter from Frederick the New Brunswick Canada and in that one, Badio did really good work and then on the ground he did all of his work so I'll be eager to see what we get out of a guy like Anders because in some respects, the takedowns carry him to wins. In other respects, he gets pieced up by Jun Young Park and goes 3 of 24 in takedown attempts and loses a split decision. So, again, it will be chintzy to see. For Anders, he's 0-1 against Canadians. And if I make it a stretch further... He's 1-1 one one with a no contest against members of the Commonwealth. Those Darren Stewart fights, wow. Matt. And we're making that stretch. You look at this one. Barrio is slightly favored to get the win. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise to us as they are to you. I'm going to say over, under. I think it's going to be close. 65% uh, power bar. I'll say over. You're going to say over? It's over. 845 total votes. Six, 76. 76% of Barrio to get the win. 65% by decision for the 24% that have Anders. 49% by decision. 42% by knockout. Who do you have in the matchup? I like the activity out of Power Bear in this fight. And I do think his pressure is going to help him avoid some of those bigger shots of a guy like Eric Anders. Because Anders does require a decent amount of space for him to land that big left hand and some of his more dynamic power strikes. And I just don't think that space is going to be there for a lot of this matchup. So if Anders is able to create some kind of in-close power shots, maybe he is able to land some decent ones. Because it's... It's not like Barrio has never been hurt or wobbled. Like, we have definitely seen it before. So, I do like the overall uh, work rate and activity from Power Bar, though. But this should be a really entertaining fight if we get that version of him. If Chris Dawkins did fight Khalil Roundtree on this card, it'd be really awkward because Eric Anders sent Kyle out of the UFC. And it was hard to see. So, that was a really good win for Anders. And for Barrio, I will go with him ever so slightly in the matchup. I, you know, before I went back and I watched the tape and I did my deep dive, I was going to go with Eric Anders. But I do like the lasting ability of a guy like Barrio. The only thing that really worries me in this one is 
the way that you looked against Hernandez. It looked great against Shabazz. I think Hernandez is a decent fighter, though. So both of us in the matchup going with Gatno, Quebec Canada's own Marc-Andre Barrio to get the win. People hate it when I French it up. It should be a big-time matchup on this card. Headlined by Nunes taking on Irina Aldana. It's a great card. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's get into it. <laughs> Coming up this weekend, a blood and guts fight at Featherweight. The fan favorite, Nate Landwehr, gets his due. He's on a three-fight win streak, all of them bonuses, and now he gets a shot at the rankings against 50K Dan Ige, who fought outside of the rankings last time out and wobbled Damon Jackson multiple times in the first round before he landed a right to the body and a left hook from Heck. And he knocked him out cold. So for Dan Ige, a great win there. Ended a three-fight skid. And if we go back and look at those three losses for Ige, one to the Korean Zombie in a main event where he got out-wrestled, one to Josh Emmett where in the first minute he got dropped by an overhand right, then he wobbled Josh Emmett That's in the second fight. round, and the third round was pretty competitive, and then he ended up losing to Mavzar Ivloyev where he got completely out-wrestled. Really, Mavzar's coming out party. But his last time out, Danny Gay did look really good. But again, when you look at a guy like Nate Landwehr, he was the American from Tennessee that they brought across the world to lose, and then he just kept winning. He came into the UFC and got knee-knocked out by Herbert Burns, who has not been a good Burns in the UFC. He also got knee-knocked out by Julian Arosa. I know this Kinda all sounds wild. strange, but for Nate Landwehr, I bet he drinks like five cartons of maple syrup in the morning if we're counting by cartons. Lowry said he just like drinks 17 Red Bulls, runs into that cage. That guy loved to run after ground balls. <laughs> this base. is the interesting thing about this fight though, because for Dan Ige, if you judge him solely off of those three losses to the elevated level of competition, then okay, you might think he doesn't necessarily belong in the top 15 outside of the Emmett fight. The Emmett fight's very competitive, but the Korean Zombie, I thought outclassed might be a step too far, but he convincingly beat him in that fight. And the same thing with Mobs there, Evloyev. And if you want to go back even a little bit further, Calvin Cater was able to outbox him. And he looked really good Just in that matchup, too. range for the majority But that's of the, for the thing about Dan Ige. I wouldn't say that he has had a big step up or step down to levels of competition. There's just a very fine line of guys who really struggle against Dan Ige and guys who are going to be able to go out there and look good against Ige. Because Ige's skill set is very much the same as it's always been. He's a very talented boxer, has extremely heavy hands, a good ground game, good wrestling. But again, if you really excel with your wrestling, if you're somebody who who has sort of that next level of it, then yes, you will be able to go out there and wrestle him and control him on the mat. And that's why I'm going to be really curious to see what kind of pressure Nate Landwehr brings into this fight. Because I brought it up right before we started filming. When Gavin Tucker just ran across the cage at Dan Ige and Dan Ige hit him one time and knocked him out, like, we've seen Nate Landwehr basically do the same thing. Just march across the cage, be over aggressive. Hold on, whoa, whoa, hold on. So Gavin Tucker's from Atlanta, Canada. Vancouver is hours and hours and hours away. Do you think BC harbors a hate for Dan Ige and they boom when he walks out? Probably not. I, it's in the same country, but it's about as far apart geographically as you can get. I just think for Dan Ige, he's been in this position before, right? Like, Damon Jackson and Gavin Tucker are both talented fighters, but it's fair to say that they're a step below the Calvin Caters and the Korean Zombies of the world. And for Nate Landberg, he's been on a really good run, but I don't think he's reached the Josh Emmett or the Korean Zombie point of his career yet. So if he is that aggressive version of himself, yes, it's going to give him more chances to win, but it's also going to give Dan Ige that many more chances to land those big and counter shots. And is one of those guys that gets counted out time and time and time again True. again True. against Ludwig Klein that's a performance bonus Klein in a way matches up like Dan Ige moving on the outside compact big power shots Ige is one of those guys though he just marches forward in the majority of his fights and he can even behind the black line lull you into his power shots and then land those big combinations and he's usually at a height and reach disadvantage and in this fight slight height slight reach disadvantage but Dan Ige is one of those guys mixing it from head to body you can really see a difference that sets him apart and has he fought a guy in the UFC with a porn star name yeah he fought Mike Santiago and he beat him but overall for Ige a lot more winning than he has done losing at the top level he is eight and five he did lose to Julio Arce in his UFC debut at UFC 220 but since then a big progression and the funny part about it for a guy like Dan Ige his last time out when he's taking on Jackson Joe Martinez listed him as such his background Brazilian jiu-jitsu wrestling and boxing 
Why don't you just say his friends call him a swell guy and he drives a Dodge just, Stratus? Wow. The guy does everything. I mean, he's Checks a catch. All the boxes. Your daughter want you want your daughter to marry a Dan Ige in life. So when it does come down to it, Nate Landwehr, a lot of great boxing. He's out of MMA Masters. You saw Themba Garimbo really push them into the Stratosphere uh, his last time out. But Colby Covington there, Priscilla Cachueta, just some of the world's best in MMA Masters. Uh -huh. I really do like Daniel Valverde and the team there. But for Landwehr, constant pressure, never gives up unless his brain and his chin evades him he can really do good work and we saw nate landwehr push a damn pace against darren elkins who has some pretty good wrestling in we the did. past as well so i really like this fight Ige is favored quite a bit he is the ranked party to this tango if we have a look at the topology votes matt surprise us there to you i'm gonna say over under 70 percent Ige. i think it'll be over i think it's gonna be over Oh my goodness. 892 total votes, 71% Ige, 29% by decision, 64% by knockout. For the 29% that have land where 60% by decision and 20% by knockout. Who do you have in this matchup? Because I know the fans have Nate Landwehr. I have Danny Gay in this fight. Again, if Nate Landwehr can make it so uncomfortable for Danny Gay on the outside, or I guess on the inside with his striking, with his pressure, then maybe Danny Gay just never gets started with his own uh, offense on the back foot or even moving forward. But I do think EK is a big enough puncher to where, okay, if he can hurt Nate Landwehr a couple of times, it's going to completely change the complexion of this fight. So for that reason, I do have EK, but this should be a fight of the night contender. I hate to go to the numbers. Nate Landwehr is 4-2 and two in the UFC. The four former M1 global champ and his strike differential 6.47 given to 5.51 taken insane, per though. minute Dan Ige 3.8 to 3.58 so Dan Ige much lower in the volume Nate Landwehr just trucks it and trains it forward I will go with Dan Ige in the matchup I think he's going to have a little bit of an advantage at circling out of some of the bad positions and making Landwehr pay Ige is one of those guys that invests a lot in the body work Nate Landwehr can too but sometimes he head hunts a little bit so I will go with Dan Ige and Extreme Tour in this matchup but this should be an absolute absolute amazing fight at featherweight i can't wait for it and i'm really eager to see who the fans have in the comment section below on this one make sure you check us out spotify and apple podcasts as well for that content and the audio podcast some big fights on this card keep it locked into fight name picks we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. Coming up this weekend, a welterweight banger. It's a battle of countries that usually go at it at hockey. We have proper Mike Malott taking on Eugene Oregon's own Adam Fugit. And if you look at this fight, we said this about a few of the fighters on the card. Mike Malott gets the hometown crowd, but Malott's out of Ontario. Adam Fugit's from Oregon. It's like a short drive for Fugit. It's a very long plane ride for Malott, but that's what makes this fight so interesting because I bet both guys get a big pop out of the crowd coming up in Vancouver and if you look at it for Fugit this is a guy with a big time Muay Thai oh. kind of yeah, I guess uh, big time, what would you Resume? call it? Resume, that's what they call it, in his back pocket, and he's been able to get it done against some really interesting fighters. We saw Fugit punch his ticket to the UFC as a giant underdog against Solomon Renfro. Renfro's coming in with a big blitz, and then all of a sudden it's a pullback right hook from Fugit that knocks out Renfro who's a former common opponent of Mike Malott, and Malott could drop twice by Renfro, and then he ended up getting hit and hit and hit some more. He drops Renfro, grabs a no-hook rear naked choke, and submits Renfro for the win. He fights Shem Shimon Smotritsky in a main event on Dana White's Contender Series 2021, gets a win there. He's into the UFC, and Malott's one of those guys that was a known commodity for a long time. I mean, this is a guy that went to school at Dalhousie, then he ends up training at a Titans, which is the gym that Gavin Tucker's represented in the past. He ends up fighting with Bellator and World Series of Fighting. At what? With less than five pro fights, Malat and a fresh face, Hakeem Dawadu, doing business. I don't know why I said Dawadu. I meant to say Dawadu. But that fight at Featherweight, and in that one, they're both doing work. And then Malat, who missed weight for that one, at Featherweight, ends up getting blitz. He gets hit. It's a standing TKO knockout win for Dawadu, who went undefeated with World Series and then lost to Danny Henry in his UFC debut. Dawadu was supposed to be on this card, taking on Lucas Almeida, but that fight fell out. But for Malat, like, he take fights here and there, but all of a sudden, a really long layoff. He's the jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, and striking coach at Team Alpha Male for a long time, so you'd see him in a lot of corners oh, and yeah we were always asking kind of silently in some of these videos or maybe verbally 
Why isn't Mike Mallott fighting? And now all of a sudden, he's really come down, bitten down on the mouthpiece. Two first round finishes in the UFC, one over Mickey Gall, and then one over Quebec's Johan Lainez his last time out. But the big tail for Malat in a lot of these fights, boy, does he get hit and rally back in these one-rounders. He does, and that's why it's really difficult to predict a lot of these fights, because like you say, normally if you get hit and have to rally in a fight, you're winning third-round finishes, you're winning by decisions. Mike Malat's getting his work done early. You're not you paying this man by the hour. He will get hurt, he will get dropped, and face adversity really early on in the fight. And that's why I'm curious to see what version of you get we get in this matchup, because if he is backing up looking for the counter shots, I would rarely say that is an effective way of fighting. But oddly enough, in this matchup, he might be able to catch Malat on the way in because Malat can get a little, maybe overexcited It's not the right term, but he will start to overcommit on some of his strikes if he is blitzing forward. And that's a world where Adam Duguette could move on the back foot, hit with one of those counter shots. And that's where both guys are a little bit volatile in the way that they fight. Because I could also see that same world where Malat's moving forward, hits him with one of those big shots, and then can submit him on the mat. Because Malat does do what I love seeing a lot of fighters do. He can hurt you on the feet and submit you on the mat and not try to waste a lot of ground to pound and kind of tire himself out doing that because there seemed to be two or three really 10-15 prospects every year where it felt like that's how the UFC debut would go. They'd drop some guy, look really good, get tired doing ground and pound and they would have nothing left. From a lot, I do like his ability to go for submissions after his initial striking success on the feet. And you saw a few get his last time out taking on Kinoshita where he was able to have a lot of success on the feet. He did get rocked and dropped early, but he rallied. He's able to get the fight down to the mat and listen, he had that back mount. Oh Kinoshita was going nowhere. You thought maybe the round was going to end, but then he started to land those big elbows, and that was all she wrote. So Fuget gets a big win his last time out, and even in his debut, on incredibly short notice, he replaces a big-time fighter and takes on Michael Morales, who's now 14-0, and and he's going to be fighting Max Griffin coming up in July. Fuget looked good in the first two rounds of that fight, and then he gets dropped in the third round after his coach asked him, are you having fun? Are you having fun between rounds two and round three? He said yes, he was. So for Fuget, he's got that uh, background in Muay Thai. He's good with his jiu-jitsu in these fights. And if you look at it, even coming up, he had lost to Austin Vanderford, who ended up fighting for a Bellator title and won on Contender Series. Great. It did not go great. And he had a loss to Kalen Hill, who ended up on Contender Series as well. So a good background for Fugit. He's going to have that kind of hometown feel because he's from very close by. Training in and around Portland. Art of War, uh, MMA and Fitness. An Oregon guy is Fugit. And when it does come down to it, he did an interview with... James Lynch, All Access MMA, and he said that, uh, listen, when he started his amateur Muay Thai career, it was in Vancouver, so he hopes to have those same fight fans with him. He also could have Evan Dunham in his corner, who actually fought at UFC 115 and beat Tyson Griffin. Had a one. draw against one half of the co event, event, Benil Daryush at 217. Like a Jesse Ventura type, just fighting to draws. But yeah, some wild stuff from Evan Dunham, but for Fuget, awesome to see all of that. For, for both of these guys, you look at Fuget, Long sidewinder type of southpaw who holds his hands really high, but when he gets that hook out there, when he gets that straight left hand, it's good. Fugit's one of those guys that's going to kick to all three levels he from will, distance, yeah. and he throws a great head kick really quick. Mike Malott will hold his hands up really high, and he kind of leads with his head. His leg kicks are really good, but he doesn't throw a lot of kicks to the body or to the he head. Doesn't. So I'm eager to see what we get out of these two guys because, to me, it feels like the younger fighter out of Canada on a win streak is probably the A-side. And Fugit's almost brought in to lose, but we saw that out of Fugit his last time out. Kinoshita was a big favorite. For sure. And Fugit, we threw up a lot of red flags as to how he could win. We didn't necessarily pick him. So Malat is favored to get the win in the matchup. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise us there to you. I'm going to say over under 82.5% Malat. I think it'll be under, but it'll be the favorite. It's way wow. over. 861 total votes, 93% Malat, 14% by decision, 29% by submission, 49% by knockout for the 7% that a Fugit... 59% by knockout. Going back and watching the tape study, Matt, more red flags than green flags? I favor the hand speed, though, of Mike Malott if he's able to get inside the pocket. And that's why I do have this He is this really matchup. quick. He is fast with his hands. Fuget does have good power if he's able to land on those counter shots. That's why I wanted to bring those up. But if Mike Malott's not charging forward, if he is able to plant his feet and use his boxing combinations, I do think he has the edge in that position. And for those reasons, I do have Mike Malott. I like the body work out of both these guys. I know Dan Tom's probably going crazy out there. He loves that body work on Twitter. But both these guys do really good work with it. Malott, it's a lot more boxing combinations. Oh, yeah. Fuget, it's a lot of that Muay Thai lineage. 
I do ever so slightly have Mike Malott in this one. Again, he's got a lot in terms of teammates and training partners that are coming to this. Jasmine Jazz Davizius, Kyle Nelson as well. Maybe you can lump Diana Bell Beats into that, but I doubt they really see the training mat at the yeah. same time. But when it does come down to this one, an interesting look for Malott at the start of his fights, because he'll start with Southpaw for about a minute. And then he switched to Orthodox, and then he'll kind of go between the two and flow a little bit. So eager to see how that one plays out. And maybe Brother Jeff will be there with him. Manitoba Moose's own Brother Jeff, just doing the hockey. So a big-time fight coming up this weekend. Both of us going with the Canadian proper Mike Malott to get the win. But let us know if you have that tricky southpaw sidewinder Adam Fugit, because my confidence is shattered in the matchup. Some big time fights, Matt. Charles Oliveira is taking on Benil Dariush in the co main event. In the main, Amanda Nunes, Irina Aldani. You're not going to want to miss any of it. Keep locked in with Fight and Apex, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. Big time fight feels co main event. There's an eight fight win streak on the line for King's MMA zone, Benil Dariush. When he takes on the former champ, Charles Oliveira, Du Bronx is coming off of a title losing performance against Islam Makachev. His last time out got dropped in that fight, got finished on the ground. It was wild to see. And you talk about win streaks, Oliveira was on an 11 fight win streak. And ultimately, he will end up in the UFC's Hall of Fame. And the all time metrics marks number one or tied for number one in bonuses, number one all time in finishes. If Donald Cowboy Cerrone can get there, Charles Oliveira can too. And if you consider this matchup, I mean, a lot of things at play. You got the ultimate fighter going on right now, McGregor versus Chandler. You got Gaethje going to be taking on. Just a wild fight against Dustin Poirier for the BMF belt. And still up there at lightweight is this fight in the co-main event of the pay-per-view this weekend. And for Charles Oliveira, he's fought in Canada before he fought in Saskatoon against and Max Holloway. It was the weirdest fight ever. It was a weird fight. For Benil Dariush, that shorter plane ride coming up from California to BC. But when you look at this matchup, Matt... I mean, both guys, adept on the ground. Both guys, they have... They're way more similar than you probably think, which is kind of crazy They to have 50-50 striking battles, so this should be a lot of fun. Obviously, Oliveira has been dropped. He's been finished in the past. Benil Dariush, you want a crazy fight? His fight against your car close. That's a crazy one to go back and watch. So, I love this fight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And both of these guys, Matt... I mean, one guy kind of wrote the blueprint against Tony Ferguson. The other guy executed exactly. on it even more. But both of these guys are good really wherever the fight takes them. Well, it has been a really long burn for a guy like Benil Dariush. And it's wild that it's taken him this long to finally get a marquee fight like this. Because for Benil, he was really on a lot of people's radar when he had fought guys like Jim Miller, when he fought Michael Johnson. And I remember him losing to Michael Chiesa and going into that James Vick fight. Because that was on UFC 199. One of my all-time favorite pay-per-views because Michael Bisping beats Luke Rockhold, of course, in the main event. But... But Nil went out there, walked forward against James Vick, and knocked him out like it was nothing. Threw big overhand lefts, and after that, it was really a case of, Benil had all the skills, but there'd always be that one thing missing in a lot of his matchups. I brought up the Evan Dunham fight, oddly enough, earlier on, and I'll get back to that in a second, but think about Benil. Is he a good striker? Yeah, he's a great striker, but at King's MMA for a long time, he has insane jiu-jitsu. We've seen that a lot more as his career has progressed. We know how good of a wrestler he is, too, but for Benil, we've seen the chin get tested in the past, especially early, well, and even in the Evan Dunham fight. Think about that fight. He starts out hurts Dunham, has a lot of success early but we do see the gas tank kind of wane as that fight continues. Now, I don't think Benil Dariush has a poor gas tank at all. I don't think that's a part of the conversation. I'm just saying, for Dariush, it did take him a long time but it kind of made sense when you go back and watch all the performances and that's why I'm such a big fan of this fight when it's happening right now. Some fights you get a year too early, some fights get a year too late. I think this is the best time for these two guys to be fighting because we have never seen Benil Dariush A, on a more exciting point in his career or be at a better point of his wow. career. And for Charles Oliveira, he brought it up himself. There is a champion his name is Charles Oliveira. And he laid an egg against Islam Makhachev. Let's just call it while it was. He called himself out for it. He said, I was off that night. You're going to see a better version of me. So if we get an Oliveira who has a fire lit under him versus the Benil Dariush who has looked like an absolute wrecking machine as of late, this could genuinely be fight of the year caliber stuff. Well, look at Dariush against Scott Holtzman. Look at him against Jakar Close. Look at these fights that he's having. The Jakar Close fight, if you don't remember Think at the end of that fight. Yeah, the commentary team has crazy reactions. But that DC, Rogan, and Anik freak out, that's the meme Iconic. that you see all the time. You just maybe didn't know what fight it was from. Dariush has really brought all those skills together. And even though he's gotten cracked in some of these fights, he's been winning them. You look at his last loss, 
it's the one that you think of. It's back in 2018 against Alexander Hernandez on short notice. And if you look at it for Charles Oliveira, that big win streak, it wasn't without getting cracked in some of the fights well, and having to storm back. The Michael Chandler fight's probably the best example. Both these guys were in a weird spot. I'll get to the Michael Chandler fight in a second, but Oliveira, remember when he fought like Jared Gordon and Nick Lett? Like, they gave Charles Nick, Oliveira... Which, which Nick Lett's fight? One, well, two, or three? Just, the first, like, seven fights of Charles Oliveira's win streak, everybody expected him to win those fights. And for Dariush, he did have kind of a reset, too, with his level of competition. And that's when I feel like we really saw him kind of put together all of his skills and find out really where he sits in the and, world. Because and, ever since Dariush did go and have those Holtzman fights, had the close fight, it really did help him become a much more well-rounded mixed martial artist. And we saw that in the Tony Ferguson fight. I know Tony's not in his prime anymore, but the fact that we saw the whole complexity of his skill set, we saw the strikes, we saw the takedowns, we saw the top control... I'm going to be so interested the second this fight hits the mat because Daryush has been submitted in the past. I know I brought up the Michael Chiesa fight earlier, but Charles Oliveira, for being the greatest grappler of all time in terms of offensive submission numbers, he's also been submitted a good amount of times too. So I'll be very curious to see who is going to have sustained levels of success in the mat or are we just going to get a whirling dervish of two guys? Is it just going to be a big old scramble If fest? you just look at their last fights, look at what Benil Daryush did against a multiple-time ADCC champ and national wrestling champ in Matau camera the striking was there the defense was there everything was there for Dariush on that night and he looked great. amazing Charles Oliveira had none of it and he got dropped by Makachev so who's to say that Dariush can't do the exact same thing just solely based off their last performances I'm really eager to see how it works out for both of these guys the knockdown ratio for Oliveira might surprise you a four and only four against but again He's been put on skates He's a couple a of times fighter. in his fights. Both of these guys have. So you look at the odds in the matchup. Dariush actually a slight favorite in this one. You have a look at the topology votes to get a sense of what the fans are thinking on this one. I'm going to say over under 67.5% for the former champ, Oliveira. I'm going to say under. I think Benil will be the favorite. And yeah, 950 total votes, 52% Dariush, 59% by decision, 26% by knockout. This is a three-round fight. Should be five rounds, only Should three. Be. So that's kind of wild. For the 48% that have Oliveira, 52% by submission, 23% by knockout. So now it comes time for crunch time. The difficult part, who's the pick in the fight? I have been able to use for a reason that I haven't brought up yet. His kicks are really good. Like, his leg kick and body kick are very, very heavy strikes that I don't really think anybody gives him full credit for because, like you say, the boxing is very good. A lot of the knockdowns are from the boxing. But when he does go to the leg and the body with his kicks, I think it does help him open up the rest of his game. And if we see that body kick starting to land a lot against Oliveira, Oliveira is an interesting striker because he does have those front kicks up the middle. So, uh, again, it's not like he's a zero at that kicking range. But I think the leg kicks are going to play a factor. And... I'll be interested to see who can set the pace in this fight. Like, this is an all-time great fight, so I don't really think there is a wrong pick. But if Dariush is able to just get in the face of Oliveira and not allow Oliveira to land some of those long-range boxing attacks, then I do think Dariush can have success. But this is the last point I'll bring up for Oliveira. He's a great inside fighter, too. Remember the dirty boxing against Poirier? He got that uh, dirty clinch in the back, through the uppercuts, throws the elbows. So I, I think both these guys are going to have success in basically every range of MMA. I just slightly have been Dariush. The way that Oliveira was able to swing him in his positions against Poirier. That was something wild that you don't see very often. And when you look at a guy like Dariush, chin check the same way that we've seen out of a guy like Oliveira. For me with Dariush, you look at his fights that he had against Gamrot where does he get taken down? A, a few times he does, Reverses, but he's able to reverse out of those positions. And against a guy like Thiago Moises, well, it was Dariush having all the success in the grappling, just like he did against Tony Ferguson. So, Ever so slightly, I'll go with Benil Dariush as well in the matchup, but Charles Oliveira is one of those guys that fights at such a frantic pace. The three-round atmosphere might actually help him in this fight, and you could very well see an okay. Oliveira return to a fight against a McGregor, a Chandler, a Gaethje, a Poirier, a Makachev, a Volkanovski. Like, there's so many names out there for both Imagine of these guys. Imagine Volkanovski versus Oliveira. That'd be wild. So both of us going with California's own Benil Dariush to get the win in the fight. I didn't think we'd both say that, but apparently we both are. Matt, question mark kicks. Two hours live before the prelims. We'll see how the weigh-ins affect exactly. these guys. Oliveira. He's missed weight in the past. Well, 145, though. Yeah, we, we've seen it. So it has happened, and it could happen. You never know. So that show, two hours before the prelims, here live on the channel, leaves one more fight. You got Nunes taking on Aldana. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. The 
12th straight title fight for the Bantamweight champ. It's Amanda Nunes coming up this weekend in the main event. Nunes and Aldana and ultimately a new fresh face as a title challenger. Some it. people out there on the interweb saying that this could be Nunes' toughest fight to date. As a champ, I disagree slightly. But when you do look at this one, Matt, for Amanda Nunes, it was originally supposed to be a third fight against Juliana Pena. And her last time out, 50-45, 50-44, 50-43, the scorecard. She had three knockdowns in the second round of that matchup and left no doubts, but they were going to try and match it up a third time. So realistically... Aldana was supposed to fight Raquel Pennington last month. They dissolved that fight. Pennington ranked second on a five-fight win streak, serves as the backup. Aldana ranked fifth, coming in on a two-fight win streak, gets the fight. And for Aldana, last time out, a lot of adversity against Macy Chasson. She lands a liver shot up kick that knocks out wild. Chasson. And now she gets the title shot. And all of a sudden, Lobo Jim, a hotbed of MMA, you have champion Alexa Grasso. UFC flyweight Alessandro Costa, who's going to be fighting the weekend after this fight, as well as Diego Lopez, who came in on short notice and looked great against Mavzar Ivloyev. Things are really going well for those fighters down in Mexico. And ultimately, in this matchup, Aldana finally gets that title shot that we all thought she was going to get when she beat Phenomeno Ketlin Vieira a few years ago. And I'm pretty darn excited about this matchup, if I do say so, because for Amanda Nunes, it's been interesting just to kind of figure out which point in her career she's at right now, because the first Julia a Pena fight was not a good one for her whatsoever. Like, she really did wilt under the pressure of Pena, and she didn't look ready for the adversity that she ended up facing in that fight. Now, to her credit, she was able to go back, rebuild as a fighter, and she put on a great performance her last time out against Pena. But the big difference between Juliana Pena and Arena Aldana is... Aldana's pretty comfortable striking backwards. She's someone who can land power shots, even when she is evading your punches. Whereas Pena, we saw it, it really became a meme afterwards. Charged forward, just throwing reckless strikes. And I understand she did have some success doing that in the first fight. But again, that's kind of a Hail Mary technique to try to win a fight. And I don't think Aldana is going to lead those openings in her own striking game. That Juliana Pena ended up doing in her last fight. But the thing that I will say about Aldana and why I like this matchup so much is when you have these big underdogs, not that she's a massive one like we've seen in some of these fights, but when you have decent sized underdogs in title fights, you have to figure out, okay, where can they have success, right? Like some opponents, let's just be honest, you struggle to find any single range where they can have success. But for Aldana, I think she can look at some of Amanda Nunes' separate fights and sort of draw different positives. Go back to the Jermaine Durandamy fight, not the first one. The first one was very bad for Jermaine Durandamy, but their rematch was a much more competitive fight than I think people believe, or at least people remember it as, because yes, Amanda Nunes had a lot of top control, had a lot of great wrestling in that fight. But Jermaine had great success on the feet and, and was able to land quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, that's why I don't think Irene Aldana is the toughest title fight test that Amanda Nunes has had. She's fought Misha Tate, who was at the top of her powers, peak of her powers. She fought Ronda Rousey, who wasn't at the peak of her powers. She then went on to fight like Jermaine Durandamy, as was said. Like, Nunes has fought some complete fighters and some, spe what some I will specialists say that have offered up some different things than Aldana. I would say Aldana is much younger in her career, I guess, than Jermaine Durandamy was at that time. But for Durandamy and Aldana, they both have that same hole and that's why I bring up that fight if Aldana loses this fight she's probably going to get out wrestled convincingly because Nunes it's weird a lot of people do like to bring up her boxing and it's great her power punching is absurd for this weight class probably the best knockout artist we have ever seen go back and watch the Chris Cyborg fight that she was the other name I was gonna bring up but for Nunes again we have seen her struggle against some of these more long-range strikers I'll be curious, though, to see if Nunez kicks. Because against Holly Holm, she actually used her own kicks to the leg, and it ended up being the head kick that finished the fight. And it helped her quite a bit maintain that range in the matchup. I'll be curious if she wants to have that same kind of a game plan. Because I think at long distance, Aldana can have great success with her own hands. And even if she throws her kicks in there, I just think for Nunez, if she gets that top position, the ground and pound and the submission threat is something that I don't know Rene Aldana can and overcome. It's really weird because the UFC, they're notorious for this. It's not even the UFC. It's the president of the UFC, Dana White doesn't like catchweight fights. And for Irene Aldana, you wonder why I have an asterisk next to her graphic. 137.5 pounds. She had 140 pound catchweight against Macy Chasson her last time out. And in the first round, Darren Braun said her on screen had it a 10-8 for Irene Aldana. It was a tricky, tricky takedown attempt from Chasson. They kind of were 50-50 on the feet. And all of a sudden, Aldana ends up in a position with a crazy armbar. 
Then it gets back up. Then it's in an armbar again. And then at the end of the round, it's hammer fists, it's elbows, it's everything from Aldana. Flip the script in the second round. Chasson goes out there with wrestling shoes on really early on in the first minute. Gets the takedowns. Gets caught in some precarious positions. But it's all Chasson in the second round. In the third round, little bit of striking initially. Chasson takedown. Aldana gets back. Or sorry, Chasson gets up the stack. And then she gets hit with that liver shot. Something that I don't know if we've ever seen before. Like, it was, it was wild. wild to see that up kick. But Aldana struggled in those ranges. But we've seen Aldana in the fight that she had against Yana at that time, Kunitskaya, but now it's Santos. In that one, bloodies are up early, circling away with her hands up. That's a hallmark of Aldana. Circling away every time to her right. Circles away. Gets back into range. And then just strikes some more and strikes And some that's more. the one thing that I think Aldana can have a ton of success with. If Amanda Nunes gets frustrated, which we have seen before, if she doesn't have a lot of success with her boxing, if she does find herself whipping, she will start to overcommit. And Rene Aldana is someone who has legit punching power moving backwards. Go back and watch that Ketlin Vieira knockout. That was insane the way that she was able to land that strike. And I'm not saying she's going to knock out Amanda Nunes. That is a wild prediction to have. But... If Amanda finds herself throwing a lot of those kind of looping shots, I could see a world where Aldana can at least clip her, hurt her, and get her respect on the feet. And you talk about a fight against Holly Holm for Irina Aldana. That is her last loss. <laughs> that was a big fight. And it was a main event as well. And she lost it convincingly. But then after the fight said... I broke my foot shortly before it, and that was kind of the reason for some of her struggles. So I look at that fight with a little bit of a grain of salt. Aldana struggled getting backed up in that one. As Holly Holmes pretty good at holding people against the cage nowadays. Some would call her crafty. Uh, so for this fight, again, it's going to come down to a lot of those combinations from Aldana. She does do good work to the body, which can slow down her opponents as well. She does great work in the clinch. She does really good with her uppercuts. And when she's at space and she can set pace, that's when Aldana has a lot of success. But my my big key or big question mark for Aldana is, is the switch on or is the switch off? Because there's moments, long moments when she's at distance where nothing happens and she's content with just holding those hands there and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and then looking to kind of start her offense and counter off of some of what her opponents throw at her, which can cause her issues, especially against somebody like Nunez with the takedowns and with the boxing combinations that she possesses of her own. So Matt, when you look at the matchup, again, I understand why Pennington's not getting the title shot because of how UFC 224 went. I'm way more excited went. for this fight than I would have been that. Like, but it's that's... kind of unfortunate that number two on a longer win streak doesn't get it. Nunez is a perennial favorite in her matchup. She is in this one. We threw it on over to you guys. YouTube community tab. 67% right now going with Nunez to get the win in the matchup. Uh, out of some of the comment sections. Jonathan saying Aldana was losing to Chasson before the liver kick. I'd be very surprised if Nunez doesn't get a first round submission. Diego Lopez has something to say about that one, Jonathan. Darion saying Nunez by submission. Aldana was struggling with the grappling of Chasson. Would be surprised if Nunez doesn't exploit that. And then we'll go with uh, Gabriel who's saying Aldana gets it done with the hands. Nunez will try to brawl and get caught in the crisp boxing of Irene Aldana, Matt, the ultimate, the pick in this one, who do you have? I really wanted to pick the underdog going into this video, and I thought I was going to, because I think Irene Aldana is going to win a lot of the moments on the feet in this fight. I truly do. I know Amanda Nunes is an all-time striker. I just think her ability, or I guess inability to throw the jab sometimes to set up the power shot and just go for the power shot could get her caught if she does find herself leaning against a fighter like Aldana. But I guess I've convinced myself that Amanda Nunez's is wrestling is going to be able to win her out in some of these rounds. If Aldana's not able to go out there and get a finish, I don't know what she looks like in the fourth and fifth round against somebody who's going to try to take her down, who's going to throw those power punches. And the thing about Nunez is, that was the conversation a lot earlier on in her career was, hey, she has all the skills, but the cardio is somewhat lacking. That's been the part of her game that I would say she's improved the most on ever since she has become champion. And that really is the thing that helped her become champion in the first place. So I guess I have Amanda Nunez, but I look at this fight so much closer than the odds makers. Have. People are going to look at Aldana's fight against Chasson, just numbers on a page, and say, okay, well, in the second round, there were takedowns for Macy, and, well, she won that fight convincingly, but if you go back and watch it, Aldana actually uses a leg lock sweep to get out of a bad position at the start of the round. In the first round, she's able to go out there, get those armbar attempts that a lot of people would have topped to. Aldana's come a long way with her ground game since she came into the UFC years ago. The craziest part about it is, 
Aldan is the older fighter in the match. Yeah, I mean, but you gotta is, judge fighters by the amount of hard fights they've had. Is, and Amanda Nunes been a lot of them. It's wild. I will go with Nunes because again, I think the kicks are gonna be a big difference maker in this fight. You look at just the limited glimpses of the training with Roger Crawl, who's a great striking coach out of ATT Sunrise, helping out at Lioness Studio, and you see a lot of kicks out there. But we have seen that a hallmark of Nunes's game to mix in with her boxing, like the fight against Holly Holmes. So and if I just may, yeah. I wonder if 135 is getting hard for Nunes as to make because that was a really difficult weight cut for her earlier on in her career and I know it hasn't been a big conversation and, as of late but no. still at yeah. 35 it's not something that gets easier the older you get so I'm just curious if it is a factor for her that fight against Norma Dumont that's a coming up at featherweight can't wait for it but Matt both of us in the matchup going with the Lioness Amanda Nunes to retain the title some big time fights left on this oh, yeah. card that you really want to look out for, and you can see it from the thumbnail. I mean, all the Canadians and one adopted Canadian and Diana Belbizia in that thumbnail with the mountains of BC in the background. Awesome to have the fight leader back in Canada. Will first Elias time. Pedersen be in attendance? Will he be like no. Tim Duncan? He's back in Europe for this one, I'm sure. I bet you maybe Trevor Linden's there. Maybe get some of the Bo OGs. Horvath's not there anymore. Nah, he's in the the island. But uh, yeah, you could get some big time hockey players. I'm sure Jeff is going to get some shine. The brother of Mike Malott. He plays for the Manitoba Moose, but a lot to look forward to. Matt, in the intro, we drank the maple syrup. You can see it right there. That was a trip, so definitely something for this card. But make sure you let us know who you have, as always, in the comments section. Question mark kicks two hours before the prelims here on the channel. And one thing to note. Chris Dock was, was supposed to make his light heavyweight debut against Khalil Roundtree. That fight is off, but it looks like Roundtree's gonna get a short notice opponent. It's just a matter of who. So if any of these fights flip out or change out, like we had last weekend with uh, Naimov, Jamie Marlarkey, what a knockout win for Naimov. Oh and Jim Miller, Jesse Butler, you know that you can count on us to get those short notice videos up in time. So keep it locked in with the channel. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's get, get into it. it.